the the fire we were under, if we wouldn't have got our heads up, they could have been coming up that hill and you know try to overrun us. Because, um, like I say, it was coming through the through the cam net, which was even when we were late in the trench, not even a meter above us. Major Swift um, got the call, or however it works, up, up higher, and said we need people to go out to uh, a place called AMP Hill in Nauzad because the Gurkhas are being overrun. They're down to the last few rounds each. I think there was like 16 of us, 14 of us, some from mortars and five from my lot. So there's only two machine gun groups and uh, Keith Watkinson, who was the commander. I enjoyed the fact of you going into the unknown and, you know, I just see it as that's more of a challenge than knowing exactly what you're going to be doing. We, we got dropped off and um, right, right next to the hill, thankfully, because... Like I said, with the drums and, and certainly the mortars as well, the amount of kit you carry at times. I think I carried about, I must have had about 4,000 rounds of ammunition um, of 7.62, plus all my own personal kit. But we were told we were going out there for two days, um, so it was a two-day operation. So I had my own rifle, the tripod, loads of ammunition, food and water for two days, and it looked like a fleece or something for at night, no sleeping bag, no toothbrush, no wash kit. Nowzad was under, uh, under a lot of uh, contacts at the time. Um, when we got up there, there was tracer flying everywhere. Um, I, I think people were taking pot shots at us, but like I said, we were trying to get, get up the hill and see what was there. Did yeah, we, we got to the top of the hill, and it was just a round hillock. You know, there, there wasn't really much there. There was one little sort of building that was small. So obviously, drums being drums, we had to be at the front of the hill because we got dropped off at the back of the town, or back of the hill to the town. We had to then obviously make our way to the front. And I think that's where we, we found or fell into little old Russian trenches about that deep. Um, it, it, yeah, about that deep, there was a few trenches dotted around that weren't very deep. So we, we set up our position on the other side of the trench and, and used the trench as a bit of uh, a, a defensive position uh, until, until the morning. We all knew once we'd got in there why the Russians had only dug them that deep because it was just rock. It was just solid, solid rock. Um, uh, like as, as we got extended, we, they brought pickaxes for us and, and we were digging down for about a week most of the night and we probably got down about another inch um, and that was it. So we decided um, we'll, we'll build up instead. The mortars got the first kills on the first night when they were embedding the mortars in. Um, I think there was a Taliban meeting going on in, in some wood line where they decided to fire. Uh, I think Sergeant Gibbons knew that there was, there'd been an attack and that's where they'd gone into, so he decided to fire into that. After a few days, we had a night where we christened it Suicide Saturday um, because they just opened up on us from everywhere just as it was going nightfall. Um, I think there was like four or five different firing points and us being at the front of the hill took the brunt of it. Um, but we, we picked them out, we've we seen the muzzle flash and, you know, we, we, we've won that firefight with massive rates of fire uh, compared to them. So they never, I don't think they ever attacked us again at night or oh, as it was going dark. I think they realised the, the capability of the, the GPM GSF because um, we were on them within, as soon as they, they lit up the area of where they were, two, three seconds, they were getting 20 round bursts put on. So I think, I think we shocked them with our capability. So they never made that mistake again. After that suicide Saturday, um, as we christened it, I, I think after that they realised, yeah, this is, this is going to be a very full on tour, this. Um, you know, we don't know how long we're here. We don't know where we're all going to make it back. But if we stick together, we've got a better chance. Frankie Cannon and, and Dean Fisher, who were the two gunners, They'd be on the target within two, three seconds after well, once we got into it. And I was like, yeah, you know, we're not going to be defeated here unless we run out of ammunition, which fortunately we didn't. But we were told we'd get an extended. That extension went to, I think, five days, then it went to two weeks. And then uh, Major Swift came out with the rest of our company. Uh, we had like JTACs with us and stuff like that, but yeah, it was mainly, mainly fuselage. It was a two day operation that just kept getting extended and extended and extended. 
when we first got there, the, the early motor teams, they were easy to get because you just seen the puff of smoke from where they fired it. They hadn't watered the floor or put it on a wet carpet or something. So we'd see the puff of smoke, we'd report it to Martin Gibbons and him and his team would, would fire one back straight at them and, you know, more times than not, get them or make them disappear. But yeah, the, the, another team came in, they were, they were a lot more accurate. They knew what they were doing to hide the, the signs and I, I, I think they had a duel for quite a while. The, the whole town was dangerous because it was full of just like rat runs, as we called it, under the town and, and things like that where, you know, they, they could, the Taliban could travel around where we can't see them. And they, they know the town a lot better than us. Um, luckily, we had two good snipers with us who, who were spotted quite a lot. And they were like noticing that things are getting built up to be firing positions and things like that. So, you know, Bubble was getting dumped somewhere and like, um, or Bryce Sullivan would be like watching it and then see, seeing that, you know, it's getting built up and it looks like it's for a reason to be a bit of a defence for them in, in an attack. So they might attack us from one place, go in a tunnel, come back up there and, and fire from there. So he, he was warning us like when, when he seen anything and saying, look, it's Benny. They're building up, it looks like they're building up a bit of a position there, so that could be used for f future attacks. So it was good to have his knowledge on, on stuff like that. We, we didn't really engage with the, the locals. Um, the Afghan National Police did. Um, that they'd go down in the town. Um, we didn't really necessarily trust all of them. In fact, we, we didn't. There was, I, I'd say there's a couple we trusted, but um, <coughs> certainly one of them we ended up arresting. I was at the back of the hill uh, on a few occasions because I was the gun line to IC. It was my job to supply the guys with ammunition and keep it out of the front in case we got any direct hits there because we were more vulnerable. So I had to keep getting up and running and grabbing the ammo and ferrying it forward. I remember being, being there and seeing this Afghan national policeman and he went and stood in front of my gun, which was on the left, as I'm looking from the back of the hill. And he stood up and down about six or eight times right in front of the, my gun. So I kept an eye on him and he went over to uh, Dunks and Fishy's gun. Did exactly the same and then went inside the little building that we had up there. That It's like a shrine. As soon as he went in there, both guns just got hit. Massive roof. Most direct fire they've, they've ever come under. So we, I knew and one of the guys that was with me knew. He just sort of marked our positions on us. But I had to get back over there. And I was like, I don't, I don't really fancy this. I got one over there. And I, I, my boots were undone and everything because it was that hot. I've been airing my feet. So I just shut my boots on and just, I think, yeah, I just legged it back over. We grabbed some ammunition and legged it. And I was thinking, shit, I don't want to be doing this, but I've, I've got to get there. And when I got there, the guys would just, I don't even know how I got in the trench, to be honest. The, the fire was that accurate. But miraculously, I'd, I managed to get in there. And f all the guys would just lay down in the trench going, whoa. And I looked up and we had a little bit of cam netting. And I just seen rounds going straight through it. Um, so yeah, we, we was under like a really accurate attack for a while. Um, in, in the end, I, like me and Frankie and Duncan, that just made a decision and said, Look, we're going to have to do something. Well, you know, at least one of us, is, or two of us are going to have to put our heads up. And so we did. Uh, I grabbed the gun and went onto their position and even locked the gun off because I couldn't get up that high and just got up there, seeing where, roughly where they were because I, I, I knew anyway from when I was running and just fired a, a, quite a big burst in that area and it gave us a chance to get our heads up then and, and like I say, take over and get their heads down and make them disappear. Up on the hill, we were really lucky. Um, Chris Freeman uh, grabbed a guy who was... Um, we, we, again, we're under mortar attack and they fired a mortar and Chris Freeman dragged another one down a hole, a lad called James Allen, I think it was. And as he did, luckily, his mortar barrel exploded where they both just been because uh, their mortar got a direct hit on one of ours. So, you know, we had some very close calls. We, we didn't move off the hill. Um, like the sections that we had with us supporting us would rotate after a week or two. We had dr drums and mortars. We, we, we couldn't really leave our positions because, you know, if you take one of us out, we've only got one operational gun, really. So, yeah, we, we stayed there 107 days without a shower. And so we all smelled amazingly. 
and there was times where we, we, we nearly ran out of ammunition and, um, you know, we, we had limited water and things like that. In now's had, I was just getting normal blueies, handwritten ones. Um, yeah, so they, they could obviously take weeks to get there. And then, to be honest, and I agree with this, the, the mail's the last thing. You know, I'd, I'd rather have had sandbags and ammunition, food and water than, than, than a letter at times. I, I slept in a bit of the trench area with Frankie Cannon. And, you know, after a bit, you, you just think, right, I need, I need to disappear to the back of the hills, to the mortars or the other sections, because <laughs> it's the same. You know, you just run out of things to talk, talk about at times. You, you get that close. I, I knew what he was thinking most of the time. It was two days, then it went into five days, then it was two weeks, and then, like I say, 107 days later. It all came to an end. Um, obviously, we had 147 or 48 attacks in the 107 days from Chinese rockets and all that sort of stuff to mortars. Like we had a big duel with the mortar platoons um, where they had some specialist mortars coming, probably from Pakistan, um, well-trained, who were nearly hitting us. One landed about two metres in front of me. I had a big rock in front of me where I'd sit up spotting. And then a, a mortar landed just the other side. Um, I just remember spotting and I'd never, never heard the pop. And this mortar's landed and, and thank God it was the other side of that rock because otherwise I wouldn't be here now. And I just turned around and looked at Frankie, pulled the binos down and he said I just had two rings on my face where dust was everywhere apart from there. It came to an end and the Marines came in. I think for a while a lot of us had battle shock of some description because we found out that shutting Land Rovers or, or doors sounds like the initial pop of a mortar being fired from a distance. So, yeah, I know a lot of the guys, including myself, for quite a few months was like, every time a car door shot, I was like, ready to take cover. I'm thinking, right, you, you know, it's, it just brings all their memories back of, certainly mortars for me were the worst because there's nothing we can do about it. Once it's fired, it's fired. You know. You, nothing you can do. If someone's firing small arms at you or anything like that, um, certainly mortars, if they're firing it from behind a building or behind a hill or anything like that, me with a GPMG generally can't get them. So you, it, with mortars you sort of felt helpless all the time, whereas with the like small arms, RPGs, th they're going to give you an opportunity to give them back. So yeah, mortars I hated. It's, we, we went out for a while. You know, there was quite a lot of excessive drinking and, and partying, let's say. Um, but it just formed a bigger bond for, for us. Um, some of the lads got in trouble, including myself, a little bit. And then we were given no notice to move to go back to Afghanistan, I think, in January or February. It was a brilliant experience. You know, living under the hardships, I think you can live under anything now. So, yeah, it was a... Uh, Brilliant experience overall.